Hello. Welcome to the last lecture of uh, concurrency. So in this lecture, we'll be looking at uh, problems related to concurrency. So we have seen some problems with concurrency, right? Uh, in producer consumer problem and reader writer problem, we have seen that uh, how without using log, how it can lead to incorrect uh, execution or rather functionality being incorrect. So in this lecture, we'll be looking at a different class of bugs, uh, which are again concurrency related bugs, but which lead to more fatal consequences, okay? So uh, reading assignment, uh, I expect you uh, have read uh, chapter seven of dinosaur book or chapter 32 of a comment book. So uh, again, uh, just, just a reminder. So this will be the last lecture for uh, uh, process concurrency. So uh, from next lecture, we'll be looking into CPU scheduling and uh, various other things that comes with uh, process switching, context switching and all the good stuff. So yeah, what can go wrong? We have seen uh, various problems with uh, concurrent programs, right? So like along with the functionality being incorrect, there are other problems that can happen. For instance, starvation. So starvation, by this, by this I mean uh, a process can be just waiting or process may not, may never get access to that resource, okay? The other problem is deadlock. So here, in case of dining philosophers problem, for instance, we can have a condition where all the philosophers are, uh, have have taken one fork and they're just waiting for another fork. So they are just, they have access to one resource and they're just waiting for another, another, another resource. So this hold and wait can cause to deadlock where there is no progress that has been made uh, to each of the processes. In case of live lock, as we have seen in the previous lecture, where the processes are repeatedly doing the same things again and again without making any progress. So this kind of differentiates a uh, live lock from deadlock where in case of deadlock processes are just waiting. Whereas in case of live lock processes are just constantly doing uh, like releasing the resource and holding back the resource again within a loop. So that without making any progress. So, and uh, we also seen like what we mean, uh, like how, how deadlock can occur and what, what we mean by starvation. By starvation, we can have a low priority thread that is waiting for resources, resources that are held by an higher priority threads or lower priority, like higher priority threads is always using that resource and lower priority thread may not, may never get access to that resource. So it is starved of that resource. In case of deadlock, we can have threads that are holding a resource and waiting for another resource, which is in turn held by uh, another process. So here, uh, a case of deadlock is as shown on the slide. So here we have thread A, which is, which has resource one, whereas it is waiting for resource two. Whereas thread B, it has access to resource two, but it is waiting for resource one. So you can see that there is this circular dependency and the thread A and thread B are not making any progress and they are just stuck, okay? And we also saw that uh, when there is a deadlock that leads to starvation of the processes that are involved in the deadlock, whereas starvation doesn't mean deadlock, okay? So let's, uh, let's look more deeply into deadlocks. So what we, uh, the formal definition of dead, deadlock is that in a multi-programming environment, we have a process that is waiting forever for a resource that is held by another process, which is also waiting for an, uh, a resource. Okay. And uh, we'll be looking into more systematically how we can define deadlock and how we can model deadlocks. And we also be looking at what are the conditions that are uh, necessary for the deadlock to happen and how can we handle deadlocks when the deadlocks happen in the system? How can operating system uh, take care of deadlocks? And what are the different strategies of taking care of deadlock? So uh, to understand, to build a model for deadlock, uh, 
let's try to first build model for uh, resources and the processes in the operating system right so operating system has various resources uh, let's name them r1 to rm and these resources could be cpu or memory or network cards io devices so on and so forth and each resource ri can have multiple instances for instance we can have multiple cpus we can have multiple network cards so so wi indicates the number of instances of resource i okay and resource can be preemptible or non preemptible by preemptible resource we mean we can take the resource away from the process whereas non preemptible resource is something that we cannot take away and a process should voluntarily release the resource we cannot take away the resource from the process example of preemptible resource is cpu so if a process is executing on the cpu operating system can actually pause the process take the cpu back and give the cpu to another process so that is a preemptible resource a non preemptible resource is for instance printer so if a process is actually constantly printing something to the printer operating system cannot take the printer away from the process because that can lead to incorrect functionality right so this is there are, uh, so resources can be either preemptible or non preemptible and each process utilizes a resource uh in like at a basic level they use they follow three steps right so first they request the resource and once the request is accepted they use the resource and finally when they when the process is done using the resource the process releases the resource okay so a resource allocation graph is a graph uh, using which we model the various resources that are allocated to different processes in the system so resource allocation graph it's a graph it contains vertices and edges so vertices are partitioned into two types they can be process vertices or resource vertices okay so process vertices uh, as the name implies they indicate processes in the system resource vertices indicates resources in the system okay and the edges there are two types of edges in the resource allocation graph request edge and assignment edge so request edge is an edge from resource vertex from process vertex to the resource vertex which indicates that uh, process the uh, process is actually requesting that resource and assignment edge is in the opposite direction which is it's an edge from resource to the process and this indicates that the resource is assigned to the corresponding process so so uh, when we draw a resource graph we usually use uh, circles uh, uh, we have two types of vertices right in order to distinguish between them we use circles for process vertex for process vertex and we use squares to indicate resource vertex and there and uh, the small squares inside the resource vertex indicate number of instances of such resource for instance if there are four cpus you can imagine that the resource vertex contain four smaller uh, squares inside it which indicates four instances of that resource okay. and uh, request edge is an edge from process vertex to the resource vertex and assignment edge is an edge from instance of that resource to the corresponding process okay. so note that a uh, request edge doesn't request edge goes from process vertex to the resource vertex so it doesn't go to the specific instance whereas uh, assignment edge actually goes from specific instance of that resource to the process so as you can see at the bottom of the slide we have the arrow going from the inner small square to the process so here what it indicates is one instance of resource ri rj is assigned to the process ti okay. so an example of resource allocation graph is as shown on the slide so here we have two processes process a and process b because they are circles and there are two resources resource r and resource s as you can see there is a cycle in this graph 
basically this graph indicates that a process a is actually requesting resource s and it has access to resource r and process b it has access to resource s whereas it is requesting resource r okay so and there is a cycle in this graph which actually indicates there is a deadlock right like so as you can see so this resource allocation graph in the, uh, indicates that uh, process a is actually holding resource r and it is waiting for a resource s process b is doing the other way around and there is no way this can be solved and they are just stuck waiting for corresponding resource that is held by the other process okay so this resource allocation graph has nice properties that we can use to detect deadlocks for instance as shown on the slide a cycle in the resource allocation graph indicates a deadlock let's see if that is always true so okay this is another resource allocation graph here we have uh, three processes p1 p2 p3 and we have four resources r1 r2 r3 r4 so there are two instances of r2 that's why you see smaller circles inside r2 and there are four instances of, there are three instances of r4 that's why you see three smaller circles and there are one instances of r1 and r3 that's why you see one small circle so here as you can see p1 has uh, p p1 has access to one r2 resource and p1 is requesting r1 resource and p2 has access to r1 and r2 and it is requesting r3 p3 has access to r3 it is not requesting any resource okay so now consider the graph with the cycle so here you can see that there is a cycle in the graph right so this is the earlier graph where there is no cycle in the graph now let's say p3 requests resource r2 and this causes a cycle in the resource allocation graph as you can see this is a deadlock because uh, like there is no way we can solve this because every process is holding a resource and waiting for another resource which is held by other process and there is the circular dependency of resources okay so is it always true that uh, a cycle in the resource allocation graph indicates deadlock and just uh, take a couple of minutes and think about it right is it like if if there is a cycle does that mean uh, there is always a deadlock that's not always true let's look at this example here actually there is a cycle right so here we can see that uh, process p1 has resource r2 and it is requesting r1 similarly process p3 has access to resource r1 and it is uh, requesting r2 you can see that there is a cycle from r2 p1 and r1 p3 so there is a cycle that uh, between p1 and p3 and r1 and r2 however there is no deadlock here because let's say uh, r1 has two instances so r1 uh, one of the instances is assigned to p2 so eventually after certain time p2 terminates and r1 one an instance of r1 gets free which can be assigned to p1 that way p1 can continue and the deadlock is broken so although there there seems like p1 and p3 are stuck but they are not necessarily in deadlock okay so one thing to remember is cycle in uh, resource allocation graph doesn't always imply deadlock so yeah to summarize so if a graph contains no cycles that means there is no deadlock so that means uh, if there is a deadlock there will always be a cycle in the resource allocation graph however if the graph has cycle that doesn't mean that there is a deadlock that just means that there is a possibility of deadlock okay but that's not always true uh, that is true if uh, if we have only one instance of each resource type if we have multiple instances of resource type then a cycle in the graph doesn't imply deadlock however if we have only one instance of one instance of all resources then a cycle in the graph indicates a deadlock 
So in order for the deadlock to happen, there are four necessary conditions that should hold true. One, for the first one is mutual exclusion. That means each resource should be, can only be assigned to one process. The second condition is hold and wait. That means the processes that are involved in the deadlock should be holding at least one resource and should be waiting for another resource. And there should be no preemption in the sense the resources cannot be taken away. And there, uh, finally, there should be a circular chain of requests. So that means, uh, like uh, as we saw in in our previous earlier resource allocation graphs, so there is a P1 that is requesting resource R1, and P2 requesting resource R2, and there is this circular chain of requests. Okay, and as we can see that uh, all these four conditions, the first con the first and the third condition, are are those conditions that belong to the resource type, right? For instance, uh, no preemption, that's a property of a resource. Not, not the property of the process, but that's a property of the resource. Similarly, mutual exclusion, because uh, that's again like property of the resource. Whereas hold and wait and circular chain of requests are properties of the processes involved or it's, they are more uh, dependent on the program behavior. And note that if, either of the conditions is not satisfied, then the, there is no deadlock. So basically, if you can prevent one of these conditions, then we can prevent deadlock, okay? Because if for the deadlock to happen, all the four conditions should hold. So one easy way to prevent deadlock is to uh, make one of these conditions impossible. Okay. So, uh, so can, I mean, one, uh, so before understanding how to prevent deadlock, let's see, I mean, let's, 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 let's think of a basic idea. Okay. So uh, why does the deadlock happen? So deadlock happen because there is a competition for resources, right? So there is a process, there are these competing processes that are requesting a resource. What happens if we eliminate the competition? That means, so, uh, we just run one process at a time till completion so that if one process gets all the resources so that it is not competing with any other process. Okay. Can we generalize this idea for all the processes and all the resources? Is it a good idea? What do you think? Although it seems uh, a nice uh, in first look, actually it decreases the utility of the functions, right? So this actually should remind you of the initial batch processing systems, operating systems, where we have only one process that is running in the operating system, right? So this is the principle of batch operating systems. So there the utilization of the resources is, was very less because if a process is not using a resource, so we cannot use it until process completes the execution. So it's not a good idea. I mean, we cannot, uh, in reality, eliminating the, eliminating the competition for resources leads to underutilization of the system resources. So we cannot, uh, we cannot avoid the competition for resources, okay? or rather avoiding the competition of resources is a bad idea. So, okay, then how can we prevent deadlock? So there are uh, four possibilities, one, uh, ignore the problem. This is actually the problem, uh, like this, uh, the solution that is incorporated in most of the operating systems, like in even including Unix and Linux, where they just ignore the problem. If the processes are deadlocked, it's the user responsibility to take care of it, user responsibility to make sure that uh, the programs are written correctly. So operating system does not provide any support to fix the deadlock. Okay. The second approach, is to detect a deadlock and recover. So this is a this can be provided by the operating system. Here, operating system can detect if a deadlock has occurred, and then it can try to recover from the deadlock. Okay. And the third option is operating system can be smart uh, with the help of and with the help of programmer 
operating system can allocate resources in such a way that the deadlock can never happen. Because once, uh, let's say, if operating system knows all the resources that can ever requested ever be requested by a process, it can allocate research, uh, resources in certain way such that there is no circular dependency. We'll be uh, we'll look at it how uh, it can be done, and then finally prevention. So we know that uh, there are four necessary conditions for the deadlock. So one easy way to avoid deadlock is to make one of the four conditions invalid. So just prevent one of the four conditions and we can be sure that there can, there can be no deadlocks. So let's go, uh, let's see all these strategies. So of course, uh, we'll not be looking at condition one because that's, uh, that's just ignoring the problem. So we'll be looking at these strategies from the bottom up. First, we'll look at how we can prevent. Then we'll look at uh, deadlock avoidance approaches and detection and recovery approaches. How can we prevent deadlock? So as we know, deadlock for the deadlock to happen, there are four necessary conditions. So we can prevent deadlock if we can prevent one of these conditions from occurring, okay? Let's go condition by condition. The first condition is mutual exclusion. How can we, how can we uh, remove mutual exclusion? How can we make this condition not possible? So one way to do it is uh, make the resource shareable. So make all the system resources uh, to be shared among all the processes. Basically multiple processes can have access to that resource. So this is possible for certain resources for like uh, files, for instance, we can, uh, we can open read only files so that multiple processes can read the read from a file. And similarly, memory, we can also have read-only memory so that multiple processes can have, have, have access to that memory. However, uh, few resources, like not all resources are shareable. There are few resources like network card and printer and mutexes. These are not shareable, right? So imagine if a network card is shared by multiple processes. So they are both sending the data and, and the receiver doesn't know like the data that is received by the receiver is corrupted because it is sent by two two processes without uh, without any control. So there are some resources which are not shareable. And um, the other approach is to uh, use like data structures such as uh, like the one that we used in the last lecture. For instance, like inserting element at the head of the queue, we can we can make that weight free. Basically we can create a data structure so that uh, we can basically, we can design a data structure so that even when multiple processes are using it, there is no, uh, there, there is no functionality issue. Okay. So however, it's again hard to do for, uh, uh, for, for general resources. So although it is easy to do for simple resources such as Q that we saw in the previous lecture, but, uh, generalizing this, uh, generalizing the concept of mutual exclusion is hard. So, I mean, imagine how we can do this for dining philosophers problems, right? So one way to do this is to make fork shareable. So like instead of, uh, uh, so, so instead of a philosopher having exclusive access to the fork, we can have fork, uh, fork shared between multiple philosophers. So that's one way in which we can avoid the deadlock by making the resource shareable, basically by avoiding the problem of mutual, ex mutual exclusion. Okay. The second condition is uh, hold and wait. So we saw the first condition, mutual exclusion. Now the second condition is hold and wait. How can we prevent hold and wait? So to, in order to prevent it, we need to change the user process, right? So because, uh, Operating system cannot do this without the cooperation of the program of rather process. So, so the way uh, we can prevent hold and wait is uh, we do the resource allocation in two phases. In the first phase, a uh, process should actually tell all the resources that it needs. So in the first phase, we try to get access to all the resources that the process can ever need during its lifetime. Okay. 
and if if the uh, if we are able to acquire all the resources then we will use all the resources and then finally release them if we are if we fail to acquire at least one resource that is needed then we just release all the resources that we have acquired till now and we just start over we go back to phase 1 and we continue this until uh until completion so i mean this this actually works uh, in few systems for instance uh, in telephone companies this is how it works and it, they prevent deadlock for instance uh, uh so when you are making a call uh your uh, mobile equipment like your smartphone actually uh, all, uh it allocates all the links to the end phone or the target phone that you are making a call it will all the links are initially set up then the call takes place so in few systems it works however uh it doesn't work in reality there are multiple problems with this approach right uh, can you think of like two problems the first one is obvious right uh like inefficient use of resources because uh, a process may need resources at different points in time so if if we acquire all the resources beforehand then you are under utilizing the resources so process may need let's say a network card and file and it may need network card uh, at time t1 and it may need file at time let's say after one hour so if you if we allocate both the resources to the process so the file will be not used for one hour because it's after one hour the process accesses the file so it's the resources will be underutilized the second problem is most of the times you don't know a process may not know all the resources that it may need right and uh, and it's very hard even for the programmer to to even list all the resources that uh, a process might need or a program might need so these are the two main problems but there are many other problems uh, i suggest you to think of like other problems that can happen in uh, in this in this method of two phase locking where we request all the required resources we use them and then release all the resources and how can we solve this problem and you can see that uh, in the dining philosophers problem we actually kind of do like this can actually lead to uh live logs too for instance okay so before going to dining philosophers problems another problem with hold and wait is live logs so you can imagine that uh, we can have two processes that are going from phase 1 to phase 2 phase 1 again they're just looping because you can have one process getting access to one resource let's say there are two processes that needs the that needs resources two re two resources you can have one process getting access to one resource second process getting access to other resource and they try to get access to each other resource and then the release and then go on so if you look at the live uh, live lock example that we discussed in the last class you will see that uh, that's exactly two phase locking right so both processes tries to get uh, both the locks but they fail to get both the locks so there is they are, they'll be just looping so that is from changing the app so uh, so to remove hold and wait let's say if we can change the user program so this is how we can do it we can do two phase locking let's say uh we cannot change the app so here uh okay this is actually the third condition so we saw we now saw uh, 4.1 mutual exclusion we saw 4.2 how we can avoid hold and wait by using two phase locking now let's see how uh we can avoid non uh non prevent non preemption so basically uh how can we make resources preemptible so one way we can do this is uh, we can make the scheduler aware of resource allocation so so what a scheduler can do is a uh, scheduler can see whenever a process is holding some resource and it is requesting a resource 
And if, a pro, if the scheduler sees that uh, that request cannot be satisfied, then it can just preempt the process it, or rather it can just uh, pause the process or put the process in sleep mode and release all the resources that are allocated to that process. Okay. And we will later schedule that process only if we are able to satisfy all the resources. Okay. So that means basically we give uh, when the process requests for a resource, we allocate it. However, when we cannot allocate a resource, we see that uh, we basically preempt the process, get all the resources from that process, and then put the process in sleep and schedule the process later only if we are able to get the resource that it requested. Okay. So this way, uh, we can avoid, we can actually um, negate the condition of preemption. So basically we can make the resource preemptible. However, this is not applicable for all the resources, right? For instance, if a process is holding a network card, it's not a good idea to take the resource from the process because the process may not have finished writing a packet. Process may be, process may be uh, in, like in the process of writing a network packet in which let's say it has written half a network packet. And if you take the, network card out of the process, then the process and that half, like uh, like the half packet that it has written could lead to corruption in the network stack. Okay. So it's hard to uh, uh, do this thing. Do, uh, it's hard to make uh, resources preemptible. And furthermore, for few resources, it's even hard for the uh, operating system to make it preemptible, right? So for instance, mutexes. So it cannot know, an you know, operating system cannot know whether it can take the lock away from the process and give it to another process. So imagine, oh, sorry, if a process is old, holding a lock and if we want to take the lock away, we don't know whether doing that is a good idea or not because it depends on the program. It depends on the application, right? So. So this process of making the resource preemptible may not work and uh, it may depend on the resources and it may depend on the application. If we are trying to make uh, application specific resources such as mutex preemptible. So another problem is uh, we can change our app. So, so when the programmer is writing uh, writing the code programmer can actually try to get all the resources beforehand and then uh, try to continue execution. This, this is a perfect example that we saw in the live log in the last lecture. So here you can have multiple processes just trying to acquire resources without making any progress whatsoever. So now let's see the, how can we avoid the fourth, uh, the fourth condition and the final condition, which is non-circular weight. So we know that uh, for the, uh, this is one of the necessary condition is circular weight. We should have processes that are holding a resource and waiting for another resource. And there is a circular weight of uh, processes and the resources. So how can we prevent the circular weight? One way is to define an order of uh, resource requests so that uh, when a process is trying to request a resource, uh, we always define certain order of uh, resource requests such the, so that there is no cyclic requests. Okay, there is no circular weights. Rather, every process requests the uh, resources in the same particular order. So there is no cycle that can happen. Okay, so that's one way we can do it. So will it always work? Yeah, if we can... Uh, if we can uh, impose that order, but it's very hard to impose that order for application specific resources. Okay. And uh, so try to think of this, like how is this different from two phase locking? Okay. So, and uh, so this is a bit different from two phase locking because in two phase locking, we allocate all the resources beforehand and then execute the process. Whereas in case of uh, preventing non-circular weight, we just 
impose the order of resource requests. That way, we don't get all the resources beforehand. We just request resources in certain order. So processes can actually have access to multiple resources provided that uh, they follow the same order. Right? So uh, we saw the prevention uh, strategies. So basically we saw how we can negate each of the four necessary conditions for the deadlock. Now let's see how can we avoid, like how can operating system avoid deadlocks by carefully allocating resources. So uh, the basic deadlock avoidance algorithm, like in its simplest form, is that whenever operating system, whenever a process requests resource, so operating system can either deny or postpone the request if it finds that uh, providing the request could put the system in unsafe state, okay? So operating system has complete idea of all the resource allocation, okay? And whenever a request is made for a resource, operating system sees that if assigning a resource can lead to the can lead to deadlock, if it can ever lead to deadlock, then the request will not be satisfied. Then the process will not be given uh, that resource. Okay. So to do this, we need to have each process should uh, declare the maximum number of resources of each type that it may need, right? Because uh, for the operating system to know exactly the entire system configuration, each uh, every process should declare what are all the resources that it might need in its lifetime. And uh, and here basically the key idea is uh, whenever a process requests a resource, and given that all the all the resources that are needed by all the processes, operating system sees that if any of the process, if uh, if assigning this uh, assigning the requested resource to the process can lead to a circular weight or any of the four conditions that we have seen, right? If any of those four conditions can happen, then in that case, the resource will not be given to the process. Basically, what operating system does is uh, it maintains the resource allocation graph of the system, okay? So, and whenever a request is, whenever a request is raised by the process, that means uh, it is, we are trying to add an edge to the resource allocation graph, right? And whenever operating system sees a cycle, a possibility of the cycle, then that edge will not be added. That means that res the request for that resource will be denied. Okay, so this is, this is the basic uh, principle of deadlock avoidance. So basically operating system maintains resource allocation graph. And in order to maintain the resource allocation graph, it needs to know uh, what are all the requests, what are all the resources that are needed by each process. Okay. Once it knows it, it maintains the resource allocation graph. And whenever a request comes, it sees that if a deadlock is possible within the resource allocation graph, after we add the request edge, if S, yes, then the request will be denied. That way we avoid the deadlock by avoiding cycles in the resource, resource allocation graph. So this is, uh, although this sounds simple, but uh, in reality, this is very hard because it needs to maintaining resource allocation graph is very hard. And uh, it also needs like every, every request or like every resource request made by the process now has to go through the operating system, right? Because the operating system now has to maintain the resource allocation graph. And this might need, this might lead to a lot of overhead and, uh, and this also reduces concurrency because uh, we can, although deadlock may not like uh, may not happen, operating system should be safe. That's why it may deny deny requests to certain resources, even though the deadlock may not happen. Right, so it reduces concurrency, so it leads to underutilization of the resources, and uh, consequently this uh, deadlock avoidance algorithm is not used uh, wide, uh, is not used in practice because of obvious uh, drawbacks. However, it is used uh, in embedded systems where uh, uh, 
where we need real time guarantees right where uh, deadlocks could actually be fatal so in those systems uh, uh, the deadlock avoidance algorithms are still used but uh, in regular operating systems uh, these uh, algorithms are rarely used and another approach is to detect and recover by the operating system so the third approach that we the one we just saw is avoidance so whenever there is a possibility of deadlock we just avoid it by denying the request in the sec, uh, the other approach is to let the deadlock happen and once the deadlock happens we detect the deadlock and then we try to recover from that deadlock okay so here programmer does nothing okay and we let the system enter the deadlock state okay. and then so operating system periodically runs this deadlock detection algorithm basically it builds the resource graph on demand so instead of in case of deadlock uh, avoidance we actually maintain the resource allocation graph whereas in case of deadlock detection we create the resource graph when needed okay and then once the once we find cycles in the resource graph that means there is a deadlock in the system then we try to recover from the deadlock somehow either reboot the machine or uh, preempt certain resource from a process so on and so forth okay so uh, this makes sense if the deadlock is uh, a rare case right so instead of always maintaining the resource allocation graph if we know that uh, deadlocks are very rare so we can create resource allocation graph only when we see that uh, system is slow for instance when we know that there are certain processes which are running for very long time then maybe operating system can create resource allocation graph and try to find deadlocks rather than maintaining the resource allocation graph throughout the lifetime of the operating system okay and uh, a tip is i mean we don't uh, most of the times uh, we don't need to do this uh, deadlock detection perfectly like i mean we can use certain heuristics for instance uh, as i said like if we see that there is the like for instance one way to detect deadlock instead of resource allocation graph is to see that if a process program counter or instruction counter has changed at all okay if you see that if a program is always stuck in the same function for let's say for uh, for let's say 30 minutes then we can be sure that there is a deadlock right because unless the function is really big if uh, like a program cannot be stuck like a program like can you imagine a program in a single function doing taking 30 minutes i mean unless it's doing some work right uh, let's say a program that pc value or the program counter never changed okay and uh, never change it for 30 minutes most likely there is a deadlock okay so we can use these uh, heuristics uh, to find if there is a deadlock so we don't need to do it perfectly by building resource graph but most often uh, heuristics work uh, for 80% of the cases so let's look at a few deadlock examples in real world okay so one thing to see is like deadlocks are not caused by the system but they are caused by us programmers because uh because of the way we write programs because uh, if we don't if we cannot if we don't think of all the possible scenarios then that's when the deadlocks happen so yeah one thing to remember is uh, it's a problem that is created by the users it's not uh, a problem that is within the operating system rather uh it's it's a problem that happens because programmers did not do not did not code the program correctly so i mean other than non deadlock bugs in reality uh like other than deadlock bugs in reality non deadlock bugs happen more frequently like one example in uh, this is a real example in mysql as you can see there is a there is this atomicity violation bug this is also called uh, time of check to time of use bug so here the thread one actually checks 
uh, proc info to be null. If it is not null, then we try to call f puts with proc info as the first argument. However, between like after the check, thread two can actually set the proc info to null. So although thread one thinks that proc info is not null, by the time we call f puts, proc info could be null because thread two might have set proc info. So this is like, uh, so here user should have um, used mutex to create atomicity between uh, the if condition and f puts uh, and user failed to, developer failed to uh, enforce the atomicity because of which we get, uh, we have null pointer data reference in MySQL. And it, these bugs are very hard to detect. Like imagine if these bugs happen once in, let's say, like once in a million times and uh, suddenly you get a crash report, it's very hard to debug uh, that. Uh, imagine like uh, you get a null pointer data reference in F puts. It's very hard for you to understand like how proc info can be null unless we can model every, all the threads in the program, right? It's, it's, kind, it's very hard. And uh, we can have order violation bugs, <clears throat> in which case, uh, so here, let's say thread one is actually the one which, act, which is creating the thread and thread two is using the thread. So we can have, uh, we can have order violation in which uh, thread two could go first, in which case M thread is not at initialized because it will be initialized by thread one. So M thread is not initialized. If thread two executes first, it can again lead to uh, null pointer data reference because M thread is not uh, initialized. That will be initialized one by thread one. So thread one should execute first. So there is this order, implicit order that program has programmer has in his mind, which is not uh, enforced in the program. So these kind of bugs are more frequent uh, in real world. So yeah, no. and actually a recent study found, I mean, there are many studies. Um, most of the studies, they have the same conclusion, uh, non -dead, like non-deadlock bugs, such as the ones that we saw just now are more, uh, occur more often than, than the deadlock bugs. So to summarize, uh, we have, uh, we have looked at processes, process creation, and uh, we spent quite some time in process synchronization. We looked at various synchronization primitives. We also we looked at mutual exclusion uh, and critical sections, semaphores, locks, and condition variables. We looked at three different uh, concurrency problems: a producer-consumer problem, reader-writer's problem, dining philosopher's problem. And we also, dining philosopher's problem exposed us to a different bug like uh, called deadlock, which we comprehensively studied in this lecture. And finally, we also uh, saw how we can completely avoid concurrency issues by creating or rather designing our data structures in such a certain way that we don't need uh, locks or like we don't need the synchronization primitives. And we also saw how we can do inter-process communication by using messages instead of uh, uh, concurrent, instead of shared memory. And we also saw various concurrency bugs and uh, which are not necessarily deadlock bugs. There are other uh, non-deadlock bugs that can happen. Okay, uh, that is it for uh, this lecture and uh, in the live session we'll uh, we'll go through some of these things more deeply for instance uh, uh, we can go through various deadlock prevention techniques and understand each of them uh, in depth thank you